Hello and welcome to lecture three. Uh, last time we talked about the crusade and the conditions of medieval Europe and how the first crusade really began the process of changing Europe away from medieval way of doing things into something more modern. And what I want to emphasize is that that change takes centuries to really come to full fruition. It is something that happens pretty slowly. So this time, what we're going to be discussing is exactly how and in what form those changes really start taking place. So here we go. All right, first and foremost, uh, one of the immediate impacts of the First Crusade is the expansion of trade. Uh, the cities of the ancient world in the Eastern Mediterranean, places like Constantinople, Antioch, Edessa, Jerusalem, those had always been hubs of trade. Uh, caravan routes from overland brought goods uh, from as far away as India and China into the Eastern Mediterranean, and from there, port cities would funnel them overseas into other markets. And for um, the first time in some centuries, Western Europe becomes avidly interested in these goods and in moving these goods in large quantities. There had always been a small degree of trade uh, coming from this direction. But now, after the First Crusade, with the numbers of people who are moving back and forth, who are visiting, uh, as they saw it, the Holy Land in order to go on pilgrimages, who are trying to capitalize on the new conquests uh, that are established there, the new uh, crusader states, the kingdoms that were established. Um, there is this huge and almost immediate explosion of merchant activity uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean and taking goods from there out into the rest of Europe, sometimes over land through passes in the Alps, uh, often by maritime or sea trade. So the first places that are going to capitalize on this new trade are what are known as the communes, the city-states of northern Italy, especially northern Italy. There are some in southern Italy as well. But they are going to jump on this and begin investing very heavily. More ships, more trade routes, more merchant activity. They are going to throw money into it, and they're going to expand in order to profit off of this new uh, political reality. And once they begin to profit off the new political reality, they're going to start taking steps to make sure that they can't simply be co-opted. They can't be just grabbed and snatched up by one of the traditional medieval leaders who had ancient and sometimes less than ancient claims on this territory, particularly the Holy Roman Emperor. We'll get to him in just a second. Okay, so looking at this map, you can see uh, kind of listed here many of those Italian city-states, as I first mentioned. Um, it's in, uh, it looks like German, sorry. <laughs> it's like, but as you can see that where that red semicircle is kind of in the top uh, of the map, that's Venice. And Venice is going to be an early leader in establishing not just trade routes, but outposts along the coast of what is now Croatia and southward toward Greece in order to have uh, important kind of regional control in order to establish trade outposts and networks and places where they can anchor their ships and do business. And so they're going to expand their territory, not just uh, in the city of Venice and the immediate land around it, but Venice is going to expand overseas. They're going to use the money they make off the trade that's been opened up with the Crusader states and they're going to translate that into territorial expansion. Other Italian city-states aren't necessarily going to do that to the same degree. They're going to remain uh, more or less self-governing and running really pretty much just the city and the immediate land around the city. That's what a city-state is. It's not any effort to create a whole country for itself. It's just a city and the immediate territory around it. And as these cities jump on the same business, they invest in ships, they invest in, in trade, they invest in merchant activity. And when the money starts coming in, they start investing in soldiers. Uh, they pay for uh, troops, uh, armies to help to, to protect their city. They pay for city walls and defenses. And they set themselves up 
to be a hard target, to be difficult to boss around and push around and to conquer. And meanwhile, they are uh, sinking more and more and more money into these merchant ventures, and they're getting it back in a, a landslide of gold and silver. They're bringing goods that are highly sought after and desired. Silk, for instance, it could be purchased um, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, as a result of the caravan routes from China, uh, but it couldn't be produced in Western Europe. People didn't know how to produce it at this point. That's going to take some time before they crack the code and figure out the whole mulberry trees and silkworms, etc. They don't really know. It's still mysterious, and it's highly sought after. Spices and various other goods are highly desired, and what makes spices and silk in particular very appealing as trade goods they're not the only ones by any stretch, but what makes them very appealing as trade goods is that they're quite lightweight. And so you can have a ship full of spices is an un imaginable amount of say pepper for instance that's a huge it's so much more than a person would need but you can bring that in and then sell it for more than its weight in gold and so it makes it incredibly advantageous to the merchant you can even travel over land pretty efficiently because you don't need huge carts to haul enormous heavy like timber or iron ore or something like that uh, these goods are luxury goods they sell for very high prices for very small amounts of weight. So it's a tremendously lucrative trade. Um, and so the, the agricultural surpluses of Europe are being exchanged uh, for these uh, luxury goods from the East. It's more complicated than that, but that's the basic gist of it. Then the city-states take that money, and this is the important thing to uh, understand, and they start translating it into insurance policies. Things like walls, things like soldiers, things like alliances with their neighbors in order to make sure that no one can come swooping in at the last minute, 11th hour, and simply grab up the city and keep the profit for himself, someone like the Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor uh, controls a big swath of Central Europe, and technically, um, in his claims, most of Italy at this point is uh, part of what he claims to control. Um, it's complicated exactly why. We don't have time to get into all of it, but basically it has to do with family trees and inheritance as well as conquest, the claims of Charlemagne going back to the year 800 or so, so a good long while before now, <laughs> 400 years earlier. Uh, and what we see in around the 1150s, 1160s, 1180s uh, into 1200 is the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa uh, trying to reassert control over northern Italy. He really wants it because they're rich and getting richer and he wants a piece of that. And they're in beautifully placed to uh, translate um, the new trade from the Eastern Mediterranean into wealth. They already had the infrastructure, the port cities. They already have the uh, the trade routes locked down. Uh, some of the inland city-states, in case you're wondering, how did they possibly benefit from this new maritime trade? Well, they benefited because they were the logical pathway. Ships could go from Venice, for instance, over to Edessa or Antioch or Constantinople, uh, bring back goods, zoom on backwards, or to Greece or, con or wherever else, and zoom on backwards, land at Venice, and then goods could be brought over land to those inland city-states, and then from there, northward through the Alps. There are only a few Alpine Pass routes, especially as it gets uh, more toward the winter. There aren't that many that will remain open, uh, ways to go through the Alps. And so these city-states are placed very conveniently at the kind of the mouth of this river of traffic of people who are moving overland from Italy into Central Europe. Now, this was effective uh, during this type, this period of trade, because the goods that are being traded are incredibly valuable in small volumes. You don't have to have a ton of spices or a ton of silk to make money. So it's not impractical to load them onto a cart or a donkey or even in your own pocket, carry them north and sell them for a lot of money. 
it wouldn't work very well to move, say, timber or iron ore or something like that. At any rate, these city-states start making money. The emperor wants them. They don't want to be got. So they band together and create something called the Lombard League, and they prepare to fight off the attacks of Frederick Barbarossa. He is, in fact, going to come after them. Uh, communication is going to break down. He is going to, to lobby a full-scale war against the member states of the Lombard League. They're going to fight. And this is where we say, ha-ha, we're moving toward the modern world. They win. These city-states band together, create a federation, come to each other's mutual defense, use the most cutting edge in weaponry, technology, techniques, uh, soldiers that they've hired from wherever else. And when the Holy Roman Emperor fields his big, fat, old-fashioned army and comes marching to the south to fight them, they fight him off. They defeat him badly enough that he's going to have to withdraw. He doesn't and nobody ever does, the royal uh, heads of Europe. He doesn't admit that Northern Italy is independent afterwards. He's like, well, I'm going to withdraw my army and uh, okay, but you technically still belong to me. On the other hand, the Lombard League is like, ha ha, he's gone. We're doing what we want. We're independent. So they declare their se themselves independent. They take their new money and their new economic change and translate it into political independence practically speaking. He's still going to claim them, but they just don't acknowledge it. Okay. All righty. So after years of this, Frederick Barbarossa is like, oh, forget it. This has just gone very badly. What can I do now? I think I'll go on crusade. Part of his uh, motivation for that, I'm not going to get into all of his whole biography, even though it's fascinating. But uh, part of his motivation is to kind of satisfy the demands. He's trying to get the Pope on his side. Uh, we'll talk about why he wants that later on. He's trying to get the Pope on his side. He's trying to get his nobles kind of rallied behind a cause. He's also hoping to uh, win um, loot and territory and bolster his position that way. So he decides he's going to go on crusade. It doesn't particularly go well to, due to no small part to the fact that he dies. In 1190, he shows up and there are several different accounts of what happens in his death and they don't agree with each other. In one account, he goes swimming in a river just to take a bath because he's dirty or something and he unexpectedly drowns. In another uh, account, he's trying to cross the river on his horse in his armor. He falls off his horse and because he's wearing armor, he falls to the bottom and drowns. In another uh, account, he's swimming in the Adriatic. What we do know about Frederick is that he did apparently like to swim and was a good swimmer. So his death is somewhat mysterious here. We're not entirely sure what happens, whether he gets, I mean, rivers can be extremely dangerous uh, to swim in. You never know whether the currents can get you. Um, or if he got caught or he had a heart attack or who knows what happens to him. But what is agreed is that in 1190, he shockingly is just swimming one day and drowns. And that leaves an interesting power vacuum. In addition to having to abandon that crusading effort, um, what it does is it opens the door even further for those Italian city-states to go their own way and for expanded influence of other uh, important I guess, political and economic figures in Northern Europe as well. Remember how I mentioned that the Italian city-states are going to lock up trade by boat, by sea, in the Mediterranean and Eastern Mediterranean, but there are all of those trade networks of people moving over land with the goods that they're carrying. Well, those overland routes, some of them along rivers, uh, that's where you see the major kind of pink lines on here. They're following river routes for the most part. Some of them along the northern coastlines are going to, uh, the cities that are on these major trade routes are going to form something called the Hanseatic League during this time period. And what that means, I'm giving you the very kind of fast and dirty version here. It's a trade alliance. All of these cities kind of join up and they agree to a bunch of terms. And those can include everything from uh, kind of common agreed upon rates that it costs to like unload a shipment 
of goods uh, to uh, kind of tax and import duties, everything from that to mutual defense treaties. And this is what makes the Hanseatic lead so politically important. Not only are these trade networks where the leaders of these towns and cities are the ones who join the network or don't join the network, but the leaders of these towns and cities are going to contribute to a central fund and are going to provide military support for themselves and the other members of the League. So they'll run a Coast Guard, for instance, in the North Sea, as well as uh, paying for soldiers that defend both the roadways and the towns that are members of the Hanseatic League. And all of the League cities do this. They all chip in, they all provide their own uh, sort of help and support. And if one of the League cities is under attack, the others are legally obligated to help to go and do so. Now, this is a really politically complicated situation because most of these cities are not in any way independent. They're not acting even as freely as the northern Italian city-states. They all technically belong to various kings. Some of them belong to the Holy Roman Emperor. Some of them belong to the King of England. Some of them belong to the King of France or Denmark or various other places. They all are under the jurisdiction of different governments. And yet they're acting independently. They're acting as though they're free agents, including creating military support for themselves and each other. In this way, you see yet another example of fracturing, where the military is no longer purely in the hands of that old-fashioned medieval kind of pyramid of power where you have local nobles that answer to bigger local nobles who answer to the king. Instead, this new kind of way of making a living, town life, urban life, merchant life, is also creating a new way of defending that way of making a living. Confederations of uh, allied states, allied cities that have uh, invested in mutual defense. So it's another challenge to the authority of kings and local nobles, and they're going to respond to that. So the Hanseatic League is yet another kind of factor pulling Europe away from the old medieval way of doing things and toward something else. The economy is changing, uh, political structures are changing, the percentage of people who are living in towns is starting to slowly grow. It's all changing. It's in the works. One last uh, major area of the world where we're going to talk about um, town life and independence and uh, the money generated by trade being translated into political power is in Switzerland. Uh, we don't tend to think about Switzerland very much when we talk about um, kind of geopolitical history, I suppose, but it's actually a very important place, especially during this time uh, after the First Crusade and during this efflorescence of this new merchant activity. Because of the same thing I mentioned a few minutes back, Switzerland is an alpine country. It sits to the north of Italy and kind of in between what is now Germany and what is now France. The major trade routes, the major pathways from Italy into Central Europe pass through Swiss territory. Switzerland was divided in the Middle Ages into something called cantons. Uh, so it's basically like counties, um, regions uh, that often have um, a decent sized town in them, but they're more rural uh, than we would picture, say, the Italian city states by far. They have much smaller populations. But you have these kind of like county type regions and they were ruled by local nobles. And technically Switzerland was divided a little bit. Most of it answered to the Holy Roman Emperor, technically, although it didn't take a lot of interest in it. And much of the rest of it answers to the King of France, technically, and a few other scattered places here and there. What happens after the First Crusade, when that had that explosion of trade, is that these Swiss cantons start getting very, very wealthy. They are placed along the major passes through the Alps, and so they're well positioned to create infrastructure that these new merchant travelers can take advantage of. So they build up towns so they can put in uh, places to stay, inns, restaurants, bars, places to buy supplies uh, on your way through the Alps, uh, places where you can actually stop and have a marketplace so that different merchants coming and going can kind of not have to go all the way to their destination. They can go kind of halfway and meet a different merchant and sell their goods kind of there. It's It ends up being a place where they can really benefit and 
profit from this new travel and this new uh, traffic through their territory. They're also in a beautiful position to collect tolls. Uh, because the pathways and tracks can be quite treacherous, uh, many Swiss cantons begin investing in building bridges. Now the picture on your right is actually, a, it's a, a picture of what's there now. Um, it, it's an area that was referred to as the Devil's Bridge. The first bridge was built over this chasm um, in the 13th century. The bridges that are there currently, the one on the top is the, the bridge from 1958. And you can see that looks like a, a modern bridge and it disappears into a tunnel under the side of the mountain there. Um, it's got guardrails and it's safe enough. Uh, below it, you can see the bridge from 1826, which looks a lot more like the original 14th century one, where you see that tiny path that hugs the side of the mountain. Then you have that, um, that terrifying bridge that goes over the, the deep ravine. If they controlled uh, pathways like this, and the only other alternative was climbing all the way down into that valley and all the way back up the side of a mountain on the other side, you can imagine how the Swiss were beautifully placed to collect a lot of money on traffic that wanted to pass through their territory. In addition to this, they take the money and they're going to invest it very much the same way that the Italian city-states do and the same way that Hanseatic League towns do. They take the profits off of these ventures and they invest in the military. The Swiss are going to invest in new weaponry. They're going to invest in new armor. They're going to invest in new training. They're going to invest in establishing and maintaining a outsized, compared to their population, military force. The Swiss, in fact, become so famous for having these great soldiers uh, who were fantastic. They become famous as the best mercenaries money can buy in the 14th and 15th century. That's why if you go to the Vatican today, and want to visit. The, the guard that's in charge of protecting the Pope are known as the Swiss Guards. I don't believe they're actually Swiss anymore, but they're called the Swiss Guards and they're in these old fashioned uh, kind of late medieval uniforms. Uh, and it's a callback to this time period where the very best in hired soldiers you could possibly get were from Switzerland. Now this is gonna translate logically enough. If you have a powerful army and terrain that looks like you see pictured there, how appealing can you imagine it could possibly be if you were the king of France or the Holy Roman Emperor? And believe me, the Holy Roman Emperor is put out by the fact that Switzerland starts collecting all this money and doing their own thing. And when he says jump, they say, eh, nah, we don't think we're going to obey you anymore. We're declaring ourselves independent. And he thinks about invading Switzerland, but then he thinks about what Switzerland looks like and says, you know what? Fine. And so you see yet another example of how the money and, uh, I guess, new logistics uh, following the First Crusade are translated into new political independence uh, for Switzerland, as well as for the Italian city-states, and a degree of independence for the members of the Hanseatic League. Okay, so here we go. Um, there are other crusades, as I mentioned. The first one is really the only uh, major successful one. I'm just going to go through this really quickly. There are crusades that are going to follow afterwards, including the third crusade. And that's the one where Richard the Lionheart, if you've ever heard the Robin Hood stories, Richard the Lionheart is good King, King Richard, who's off on the crusade, leaving evil Prince John at home to you know, bungle things in England. Um, that legend really has done a disservice to a lot of students of medieval history. Richard I of England, known as Richard the Lionheart, was an absolute disaster of a king. He was awful at it. And he wasn't particularly interested in it, I suppose, to his defense. Um, he uh, is... One of, uh, he's not terribly many generations away from William the Conqueror in 1066, who had taken over England, um, and he's the one who conquered it. Um, and like his predecessors, Richard doesn't speak English, <laughs> good King Richard. Uh, he speaks French and uh, is conversant in Latin and some other uh, bits and pieces of German, etc. But he doesn't speak English. He doesn't care to speak English. He doesn't like England at all. He was king of the place for 10 years and spends less than nine months in the country. 
Uh, he's not very interested in pretty much any aspect of being either the King of England or the Duke of Normandy, which is his other title. So he controls a big chunk of France as well. What he is interested in is crusade. He loves the idea of it. He loves the experience of it. He loves being on, on the warpath. He loves everything about it. He's not especially successful, but he does love it. Um, and so that's what he wants to do all the time. And so he spends all of his time and effort as King of England and as Duke of Normandy squeezing money out of his nobles. He's going to spend all everything in his own treasury. He's going to keep coming up with new ways to impose new kinds of taxes and inheritance duties on the people uh, that serve under him, his vassals. He does this in France as well as in England, and he really leans hard on England because um, the king of England, to make a long story short, has a much tighter hold on England than the Duke of Normandy has on France and the king of anywhere else in Europe has over their country because of the recent conquest in 1066. They were able to draw up a totally new set of account books and they know exactly how much money they can squeeze out of the place and they've set up a very favorable system to themselves. So to, that's a very vague way of putting it, but the point is he's squeezing every drop of money he can out of England. He's not actually doing much of his job, and he's absent so long on campaign and on crusade that he really is neglecting his duties back at home. And so time will pass. Nobles in Normandy will rebel. People in England will rebel. There's all kinds of angst. There's all kinds of trouble. Every so often he comes marching home, slaps everybody back into submission and then goes back on crusade. He was just terrible about it. And the worst part of the whole thing from the perspective of his vassals is that he wasn't even succeeding. He didn't even win in his battles. He was up against an enemy who was much cleverer and better than he was, who had finally actually united um, the response of the various ethnic groups in uh, the Levant and had, were pushing back against him. And he was just losing territory and losing territory and losing territory back down to the city of Accra. That's a long way of saying he's not very successful at all. He's obsessed with the crusade. He doesn't really. Okay, so my favorite story about Richard the Lionheart, and I know it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but I find it very funny, so we're going to take the time. Um, Richard was traveling uh, through Central Europe at one point through the territory of the Holy Roman Emperor. He didn't have permission to do this. He was doing it to take a shortcut so that he could uh, put down yet another rebellion. And he gets caught. He's captured by Henry VI and held for ransom, a king's ransom, as it were. And so the Holy Roman Emperor sends a letter to his brother, John, who's regent. He's the one ruling England in Richard's stead. Now, remember, England is bankrupted by Richard's horrible policies. And Richard himself is not anywhere in the country. He just leaves his brother to deal with all the fallout. And so John is so frustrated. He can't stand Richard. And so he gets this demand to ransom him. He's like, uh, I can't, I'll do you one better i'll pay you eighty thousand silver pieces to keep him and of course the holy roman emperor is a little bit flabbergasted by this he's like uh okay that's exciting richard might have languished there forever were it not for the fact that his mother eleanor of aquitaine finally uh, finds out about his plight gets together money and resources and comes and bails him out so Richard the Lionheart had to get sprung out of jail by his mom. Um, now, this isn't quite as embarrassing as you might think. Eleanor of Aquitaine uh, was a fascinating and incredibly powerful figure in her own right. Her marriage with Richard's father was the stuff of legend. Um, and the two of them together were just a hot mess. But we're not going to get any more sidetracked than we already are. Anyway, um, Eleanor, his mom, comes and bails him out. And of course, Richard goes right back on crusade and continues just wasting every cent that he owns on something that is accomplishing nothing. Um, so Richard's main competition, you can see him here, Saladin, Salah Adin, um, is a Kurdish leader. Um, and he's the one who is going to be responsible largely for uniting the various ethnic forces uh, that had been in competition with one another to fight back collectively against the Crusaders. Um, so 
They are going to band together, uh, form a series of armies, and he's going to be the major strategist that is going to push back against Richard I. You would think Richard would imagine him as some terrible enemy. But in fact, that's not the case. Uh, Saladin, as his name is rendered into English, becomes a key and important cultural touchstone of a figure because he was famous. And we know this from accounts that are written in Arabic as well as accounts that are written in Latin by uh, people like Richard's entourage that describe him. And universally what they say about Saladin is that he was courteous, uh, that he had very excellent manners, that he had showed mercy to his defeated enemies and the helpless. Uh, he was kind, he was intelligent, he was pious and sincerely religious. He had this great charismatic leadership and his men would follow him anywhere. He was admired by everyone. He was sophisticated, he was skilled, and he was a, a masterful strategist. And Richard had the deepest man crush on him you can possibly imagine. He thought Saladin was the best thing since sliced bread. And he's vocal about this. Richard at one point uh, laments the fact that this war even has to happen and he contemplates Plates the idea that if it were just possible to arrange some kind of marriage between Saladin and like Richard's sister or something, we could resolve the whole thing very peacefully and it would all be solved going forward. So kind of like the First Crusade in itself, uh, Richard's interaction with um, Saladin becomes an example of this kind of medieval style, Western European uh, kind of cultural person really being impressed with, interested in, and interested in imitating uh, what he finds in the culture of uh, the Levant, in the culture of the Eastern Mediterranean. And so regardless of their religious differences, Richard deeply admires Saladin and is going to model his own. He's going to talk about him in such admiring terms that if you've ever heard of chivalry, the concept of the knight in shining armor defending the weak and um, acting as the champion of, uh, you know, the downtrodden and um, owing their loyalty and having courtesy and all that kind of wonderful stuff. If you ever uh, familiar with that concept, it's taken not from any model drawn from Europeans or from European medieval knights, certainly who were nothing like that. They were basically ruffians. Uh, instead, it's the fusion of that European kind of armored ruffian uh, tamed and modified and infused with the manners and sophistication of Saladin and figures like him who were deeply admired by ironically enough, crusaders. So Saladin uh, is going to win uh, most of his battles with Richard. There are a bunch of exciting stories about it, which we don't have time to get into. But um, to give you an example of what I mean when I say that they had very contrasting outlooks on warfare that was very eye-opening to Richard. Richard wins a battle at one point. He captures a whole bunch of prisoners. And uh, when he captures them and gathers them up. The standard thing to do when you capture a whole bunch of prisoners of war usually is to ransom them. You hold them until whoever's responsible for them agrees to pay you a ransom or does a prisoner exchange or something along those lines. Richard's in a terrible position. He doesn't have enough food to feed them. He can't hang on to them. He knows he can't actually defend the position he's in. And so what he does is he lines up several thousand people he captured as a result of the capture of a town and slaughters them all. He just has them all stabbed to death and because you have to stab them all to death individually it takes him about three days uh, to go through and execute everybody it was awful he gets a reputation in the middle east for this for just bloodthirsty violence that is his uh, modus operandi uh, Saladin, on, the, on contrast, uh, repeats this kind of experience as well. He's going to win several battles, take a whole bunches of prisoners, and in contrast to Richard, whose approach is just to slaughter them all, Saladin will have them swear an oath to leave the Holy Land, go home to Europe, and stay there. Sit this one out. No more fighting against me. If you're willing to take an oath to leave and do that, I'll just let you go. He doesn't even demand ransoms for them. He just releases them. Um, on another occasion when 
Saladin. And it is important to know that Saladin is going to have militarily the upper hand basically the entire time. And another occasion, he finds out that Richard has a terrible fever. And so he orders snow to be shipped down from a mountaintop and delivered to Richard in order to relieve his fever so that the two of them can fight on an even playing field. Um, and so that no one can accuse him of taking unfair advantage of his enemy's illness. This is why Richard had the huge man crush and thought he was the coolest guy ever. Okay, so leaving that aside, we have notions of chivalry kind of growing out of this crusading movement, not from the crusaders themselves, but from the people the crusaders like to mess with. So after years of pointless warfare, Richard is going to die. And when he dies, as it turns out, he has uh, reveals yet another failure. He was supposed to get married. He, in fact, did, but only because his mother chased him down while he was on crusade and forced him to marry Baron Garia, his wife. Um, but he was supposed to have, you know, fathered children to inherit after him. And he just never quite got around to that. So when he dies, the throne passes to his brother, John. John is in a terrible position mostly because of Richard's policies and behavior. But in, uh, I guess, I, yeah. here's what you can say about John. Every other king of England has a number after the name, including Richard, who was awful at being king. But Richard is Richard I. There's going to be two others, uh, other kings that are going to rule under the name Richard. There's uh, at least eight Henrys. There's, ev there's every other king has number after their name because more than one person will rule with that name. John is John the one and only because he does such a poor job at this. They retire the name. Nobody wants to be called John after him. Now, part of it is not entirely his fault. His brother leaves him in a mess, but he doesn't help himself out here. He makes one terrible decision after another. John has the unique gift of being the kind of person absolutely everybody even people who traditionally oppose one another can agree to hate. <laughs> so John is just a problematic figure. But uh, I guess there's one exception to that, which is uh, just trivia. You don't need to know this or anything. But um, the one exception which makes him very unusual in the royal families of England and France is that he had a very uh, happy family life. John had a wife he apparently was honestly uh, fond of. He had many children that never tried to murder him even once. So that makes him a bit of an exception um, in English royal politics. He did have his family apparently loved him, but everybody else hated his guts. Here's why. He makes a series of bad decisions. So England is broke and he's going to continue Richard's policies of, con of squeezing every cent out of people he can. When somebody dies, he put, imposes a very heavy inheritance tax. Um, when there's uh, somebody loses a court case, he puts very heavy fees on basically everyone. He tries to impose new taxes on everybody in order to refill those coffers that his brother emptied. He is just not wise about that. And then on top of it, he decides that at this moment, when his nobles are angry and furious and at the end of uh, their rope and broke and sick of being pushed around, when he has no money in his coffers, when he doesn't really have an army that can do anything effective... He decides that now is a good time to get into a fight with the Pope. So um, there's an argument over who is going to appoint the Archbishop of Canterbury. This is an old fight. We're not going to get into all the details or history of it. But basically, the Pope um, and the church hierarchy in general had this ongoing thing with various rulers around Europe, fighting over who was going to be the one ultimately who appointed high church officials. Obviously, the leaders of the church felt that the church should do it. And the leaders of countries like John felt that the king should have some influence over this or all the influence over it. So there's a big fight over an archbishop being appointed. The pope wants one person. Um, and the local clergy want one person. John wants somebody else. They get into a big argument. And this is where John has seriously misjudged the situation. Because the Pope at this time is a guy named Innocent III. Innocent III is possibly the most powerful Pope ever to Pope. 
he is not just a person with a monastic background, so he comes from monastery training, and he knows every piece of theology and doctrine you could possibly know inside and out, but he also has training in law. He's a lawyer as well, and so he is just... And he has this very ambitious vision for where he wants the church to go. And so he's just not a person to mess with. And John messes with him. And so the Pope pulls out yet another trick in his arsenal. At this point, Popes have two tools that they use all the time. They've got excommunication, where they can kick you out of the church and not talk to you anymore. And that means your vassals don't have to obey you, by the by, if they don't feel like it. Uh, if the Pope excommunicates you and kicks you out of out of the church. That's one tool the popes have been exercising for since the beginning of the bishops of Rome. The second tool is just that recent invention, the crusade. But now in 1200, in the 1200s, uh, Innocent III is going to pull out the third tool. It's called interdict. Interdict is basically, and this is a simplification, closing the church. The Pope simply declares that since the king is in defiance of the church's rulings, they can't possibly actually conduct church business in England because of this lousy, corrupt king. So the king is excommunicated and England put under interdict, which kicks them out of the church, which is bad. Now, not every church leader is going to follow this ruling by the Pope. Some of them are going to stay open. But in other places, what that means is that the church closes its doors. They no longer have services. They don't do all of those important functions that churches do. They're not keeping records anymore. They're not performing marriages and only baptisms in the case of somebody who might urgently die. That was always the exception. They're not doing official funerals. They're not performing last rites unless somebody is urgently going to die. It's a disaster. And when you think about the fact that the church is the only one providing social welfare to the extent that anybody is, this was awful. It was an awful situation to find yourself in if you were in one of these parishes where the church was effectively closed and the, and the church leadership was in open rebellion against the king. It was an awful thing. And so common people were turning against the king as well, not just nobles who were sick of being squeezed, but ordinary people were mad at him too. And so the nobles at this point have had it. The Pope is declared that he's this rebel and a, and a false king that can't really be the king because he's excommunicated communicated. And here we get into the fun part. The King of France decides to get involved. So John, like Richard before him, is technically the Duke of Normandy as well. So even though he's King of England in his own right, he is also the vassal of the King of France. Now, in the Middle Ages, these dukes were so powerful, kings couldn't really tell them what to do. But that's starting to change. Uh, now we're moving more toward a more modern style of monarchy, of being a king. And the king of France is trying to consolidate his power. And he sees an opportunity. He sees all of those vassals in France who were angry at Richard and then John afterwards. And he's like, now is my m chance to make my move. So he declares that all of the territory um, in France that used to belong to Richard and John now belongs to him directly. He's kicking them out. He's like, if you're going to fight with the Pope, you can't be my vassal anymore. I, your fiefs are forfeit and I'm taking them back. And of course, John is mad about this whole thing. And then the King of France begins plans to invade England. And only half of John's vassals seem like they want to defend him. It's a disaster. It looks like he's going to be invaded. England's going to be conquered by France. It's going to be a whole big mess. And so he panics. You ready for this? John panics in this situation. And he's like, oh, shoot, I've got to get out of this somehow. So he cuts a deal with the Pope. He's like, uh, innocent, um, I know I kind of screwed this up. So how about um, we get out of it somehow? And innocent's like, I don't know, John, you done screwed up. And John gets angry and he's like, fine, if you want England so bad, I'll give it to you. And so he donates England as a thief to the Pope. He gives the whole thing to the Pope. And so now everyone in England has to pay feudal dues to the Pope, theoretically, and the Pope is like, why thanks, I'd be happy to accept that. At which point, uh, everyone in England and most of France is furious at John. They're like, you can't do this to us. We're your vassals. You gave away our 
territory you now we have they're subject to the pope what the, are you doing and on top of that all of this abuse of your power and the taxes and the, this has just got to stop and so they grab up john while he's traveling one day sit him down in a place called runnymede it's a collection of nobles and clergy and they force him to sign something called the magna carta the great contract or great charter um, this is 1215, and this is a watershed moment marking the difference between a medieval way of doing things and a more modern way of doing things. Because if you, we were to back up 200 years, even 300 years, what would have happened to a king that messed up this badly is that he would have found himself dead and somebody else the king. That's traditionally medievally how kings got dealt with when they were this incompetent. That's not what happens to John. John is sat down and forced to sign a legal contract that limits his power as king. And if you're interested in this, you can read it. It's in the content section of Blackboard. The Magna Carta is going to spell out what rights the king has and what rights he doesn't have. It's going to establish principles of law. And more important than any of it, it establishes the idea that the king is not the final word, that the law is more important than he is. So this is a step down the path toward constitutional monarchy. It's going to be a long haul before we actually get close to it. But this is that first movement in a direction toward a one of the more modern ways of being a king so here we go speaking of modern ways of being a king we have another example frederick ii uh, he lives or reigns rather from 1220 to 1250 he is referred to it's a long good long reign because he takes over as a child um, he's referred to uh, by many accounts as stupor mundi wonder of the world and he controls all of the territory that's in orange down there so he inherits from his mother's side a whole lot of southern europe and then there's that kind of weird band in the middle the pope is technically in charge of that part of italy and then to the north it's the holy roman empire is part of what he inherits as well frederick ii um is the product of Frederick Barbarossa and his wife, who was um, heiress, I suppose you could say, of the kingdom of Sicily. And he's going to be raised in Sicily after his father dies in that weird drowning accident. And that has a huge impact on his life uh, and outlook throughout his entire uh, life, as it turns out. <laughs> so it's a little awkward there, sorry. Um, but it has a huge impact on his life. Sicily is, it's that little island, if you imagine Italy looks like a boot, it's the, the thing that the boot is kicking right down there. That's the island of Sicily. Um, and Sicily has always been a crossroads for culture and trade in the Mediterranean. It's strategically, enormously, importantly placed, and it's it, uh, very important as a trade hub as well. So peoples from everywhere uh, travel through Sicily, and Sicily has been on the hot spot of places that get conquered. Every group of people that becomes powerful in the Mediterranean conquers Sicily, uh, going all the way back to, say, the Phoenicians in the Bronze Age. Uh, the, uh, they are going to conquer parts of Sicily. The Greeks are going to conquer parts of Sicily. It will be a Greek city-state kind of colony place for a while. Uh, Carthage, which is originally was a Phoenician colony itself, is going to conquer Sicily. The Romans are going to conquer Sicily. Uh, after the Romans, you get, um, basically, you have the Arab conquest. Uh, after the Arab conquest, you have Normans that, when they were in 1066, taking over the world. Everybody who gets powerful takes over Sicily. And so, as a result, it's this mishmash of different cultures, uh, architectural styles, languages, libraries that have books from all over the place. And Frederick is going to grow up in this environment. He's going to have access to the very latest uh, kind of post-medieval studies of law of the ancient Roman world, for instance, studies of, of the types of scientific advancements that are coming out of the Arab speaking world, Arabic speaking world. So mathematics and science, in many ways, he is a Renaissance man long before the Renaissance. He speaks, hang on, I'll just click over to the next 
Frederick was fluent in six languages. By some accounts, he speaks up to nine, but uh, he can read and write in six of them. He was a great patron of the sciences. He was a great patron of artists. Uh, he pays for them. He's going to get rid of the feudal system in Sicily, the old remnants of, you know, you have vassals that answer to their lords who answer to their lords, etc. and so forth. He gets rid of all of that. He's like, you know, we're not going to have that kind of chain of command. Instead, we're going to create something, uh, a government organized by something called the Constitutions of Mel which he bases loosely on some ancient Roman texts as well. And so what it does is it reorganizes the government so that he, the king, was in charge. He's technically the emperor. And he runs everything basically like a bureaucracy. It's a foreshadowing of the absolutist monarchy that we're going to see in France centuries later, for instance. Um, at any rate, he comes up with that. He makes those changes. He gets into a whole bunch of debates and discussions with the Pope. And one of the things that they argue about heavily um, is crusade. Frederick has no interest in going on crusade. He thinks it's a waste of time and money and effort. He doesn't really foresee any success there. But the Pope, Gregory the Ninth, at this point, uh, innocent is dead. Um, Gregory the Ninth really wants him to do it. And he's like, you should, you've got all this talent, you've got all this power and resources, you should go off and retake the Holy Land. Take back Jerusalem. We've lost it in the intervening time. Do something about this. And Frederick uh, stalls and he puts it off and he's like, you know, I really kind of don't want to do that, but fine, whatever. I'll take a break from translating texts um, <laughs> about falconry and various other things. And I, fine, fine, I'll just do it then. And so he goes on campaign. And so he's promised the Pope that he's going to try to retake Jerusalem. That was his deal. But he's not an idiot. So he meets with the leader of Jerusalem, Sultan Al-Kamil. And he's like, look, I hear and I know all this because unlike the first crusaders, I actually speak Arabic. Um, I understand that you have some political problems with some of your neighbors and you've got a little bit of a bind going on. So I'll cut you a deal. You know that we Western Europeans are never going to give up on this Jerusalem thing. So how about you surrender Jerusalem into my control and in return, I will use the troops I've brought with me to fight beside you against your enemies. At which point Sultan al-Kamil is like, okay, he takes the deal and he hands over Jerusalem so that Frederick can go back to the Pope and say, see, are you happy? We've got Jerusalem. And in return, he forms an alliance with Al-Kamil and goes off and fights Al-Kamil's enemies. The Pope was not actually all that pleased with this. This wasn't how he pictures it. But I'm telling you the story to give you this concrete example of how far uh, at least the top, this, this very sort of rarefied percentage of European nobility has come since the 1090s when we see the first crusade and they have the crusaders wading up to their ankles in blood through Jerusalem and slaughtering everybody whether they're Christian or not and not knowing what they're talking about and basically acting like a bunch of hairy barbarians. The transformation uh, that made it possible for Frederick II to exist was unthinkable two centuries before. It just couldn't have happened. This is how much the experience of that First Crusade influenced and changed uh, the people who lived back in Europe. Okay, now, other examples and other uh, important moments of change. Another uh, strong influence on what will be the expanding role of trade, communication, and interest in the wider world from Europe and how Europe is going to transfer from its very medieval, inward-looking, um, very strongly isolated, localized attitudes to one where they see themselves as kind of part of a broader world, part of an interconnected tr network of trade and communication and travel and all that kind of thing has to do with political influences from outside Europe itself, uh, particularly the expansion of the Mongol Empire. Now, if we had enough time, we would really expand on this and, and talk about it for a while. Uh, so I'm giving you the kind of unfairly abbreviated version here. But what happens in uh, Asia is you have the expansion of a very large territorial empire conquered in pretty much the classic way that large territorial empires had always been conquered up to this point and for centuries afterwards. Big army rolls up to town, lays down an ultimatum, join us or die. 
And if you join, you get a lot of perks. You get to um, have access to trade networks. You get to have uh, protection. You get to have various other advantages, sometimes building projects and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And um, all you are asked in return is that you supply people to join the army and that you pay your taxes and keep public order. And that's basically it. And so there is this massive and really rapid expansion uh, in the 1200s where a leader whom we know in English as Genghis Khan is going to expand until you see all of that green there, that huge swath of territory, uh, parts of what are now Russia, China, etc., are all kind of glommed into this big, uh, enormous empire. And what's significant about this we see even more strongly under his successors. His grandson, um, Kublai Khan, for instance, is not just forming this giant empire and ruling it. He's going to sort of complete the... I'll show you the map in just a second. He's going to sort of complete the conquest of China and, and all of those regions. He's going to start pushing uh, westward until he comes well into the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire, for instance. Uh, not only is it important because this becomes politically um a neighbor and a competitor, I guess you could say, although there's not much real competition uh, with European forces. But it's important because Kublai Khan was interested in opening up trade and communication with the West. He was interested in actually having a back and forth. And because they conquer so much territory and they have so much influence and they have so many resources at their disposal, this is going to be a pathway for communication that wasn't really realistically possible um, 200 years earlier. Uh, it's going to be an opportunity, and it's this kind of coincidence that in the Europe following the First Crusade and the, the several Crusades after that, where they are starting to really expand their outlook and think about trade as an effective way of making a living, at the same time you have the expansion of the Khan's empires, where it's this massive, huge territorial swath with all of the resources, and that are open to trade and communication with the West. And so uh, goods, inventions, ideas are going to flow back and forth in a much more significant way than we saw several centuries earlier. So science, poetry, art, technology, like you see down here with uh, the predecessor of the gun, gunpowder and um, kind of early firearms are being invented and used in the Mongol Empire, and they're going to make their way to the West. This is what oh, this is what the map looks like, uh, and you can see it's half the globe, practically speaking. The Mongol Empire is enormous, and it is stretching all the way to the boundaries of uh, the the Holy Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. That's more or less done now, but um, it's clinging to life, I suppose you could say. They are pushing way over there, and so the connections are enormous, and the potential for profit is enormous, and. As I mentioned, the Mongol Empire, Kublai Khan in particular, was open to the idea of establishing diplomatic and economic relations with the West. And so that becomes a new possibility. This is the route, this map that shows, of the ambassador that was sent by Kublai Khan to the West to talk to uh, the major political leaders and talk about what the possibilities might be for establishing relationships. Another sort of famous uh, person at this point, Marco Polo. Um, he's Venetian. He's from a Venetian merchant family. They are going to hop on this uh, as fast as they can. When they comes, it becomes clear that it might be possible to open up direct trade with um, what is now China. And they decide they really want in on this early. And so he's going to travel with a whole delegation of his family and other merchants from Venice. And they're going to travel from Venice. You can sort of see, I think, I hope, with the red arrows. He's going to travel from Venice into the kingdom of Kublai Khan. And he's going to visit several huge cities, important trade destinations. And most impressively to him, the great palace um, where he meets with the emperor himself. And he's going to come back. This whole voyage and journey takes uh, between about 10 or 1271 and 1295. And when he comes back, he's going to take the account of this journey and publish it. And Marco Polo's account of his travels 
ends up being massively, hugely popular. It's copied and copied and copied and circulated all over Europe and people are grabbing it and reading it and they're so thrilled with it because it has everything. It has, it satisfies curi people's curiosity about a place they've never been to, likely never will be to. It, it seems almost mythical and fantastic and so exotic to European eyes. And in addition to just the exciting curiosity part, Marco Polo embroiders his account with all kinds of thrilling details and he uh, fills it in with these lavish depictions of the court of the great Khan where he talks about and very likely this is an accurate representation he talks about the unimaginable scale of the place the thousands and thousands of soldiers in the imperial guard he talks about the luxuriousness of the palace and the huge unimaginable wealth of the mongol empire and all of that's true and so when would-be merchants and travelers hear this in Europe it like you can picture little dollar signs lighting up in their eyes they want a piece of this it's so romantic and adventurous to so many people who maybe aren't even merchants this idea of the rest of the world this great sort of unknown place that could be explored and could be uh, uh, understood in a way that they had never really even wondered about it two centuries before. And at the same time, you have people who are in the business of selling and moving goods who are thinking very practically about how they can create more permanent alliance, more permanent connection and communication with the broader world. So in by the 1290s, we're seeing a very distinctly different attitude than we would have associated with the Black Death. I'm mean, oh, sorry, with the um, Middle Ages, with the medieval period. Okay, so here you see why I just bobbled that last uh, bit of the last slide. Um, the, there's going to be one event. All of the seeds of modernity, of moving toward a more modern way of doing business and, and conducting government, were already in place. We've already laid the foundation for that. The first universities had been founded. We had um, leaders like Frederick II, who kind of encapsulated this uh, much more educated, much more enlightened outlook on things. We had the beginnings of constitutional monarchy. We had uh, city-states that were establishing different forms of government, declaring their independence from their royal rulers. You had all of that in place and then in 1348 the black death this is an outbreak a pandemic outbreak of bubonic plague that turns into the pneumonic form we'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment and ends up having a cataclysmic effect on life and society in western europe it's going to end up not just creating enormous amounts of suffering and destruction but in many ways, it's going to clear the way for the emergence of a totally new way of life. So, as you can see here, this map shows the outbreak and how it travels. Um, the disease itself is something known as the bubonic plague. It's a bacterial disease. It's carried um, in the stomachs, basically, of fleas and transmitted by flea bites. Uh, the hosts of those fleas are rodents in most cases, uh, rats in particular. There are other types of rodents like gerbils that can carry it. And a few years ago, there was uh, some article in a scientific journal that, that postulated that uh, something like gerbils um, in Iran might have been responsible for the outbreak of bubonic plague when it gets really bad. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we're talking about Europe because animals like gerbils don't travel there. Uh, the rat is going to be the primary uh, vector. It's going to be the creature that is spreading the plague in its bubonic form. What happens in the 1348 outbreak, however, is something that does occasionally happen with bubonic plague. It's a disease that has never been entirely eradicated, by the way. It will still pop up now and again here and there. It is responsive to antibiotics because it's bacterial. Uh, but it does, it's never been entirely eradicated. Um, in 1348, however, it becomes a massively devastating pandemic because the bubonic form, which is transmitted by the bites of fleas, 
um, transforms into something known as the pneumonic form. That's when the bacteria infects the, the lungs of the person who gets sick. And then instead of needing a flea bite to travel from one person to the next, uh, the disease can be spread by coughing or breathing or sneezing or anything along those lines. And it becomes enormously contagious. I think we've got some recent experience with how contagious diseases like that can be. It was so much worse in 1348 because they did not have a germ theory of disease. They didn't understand how diseases were transmitted from one person to another. There were a lot of theories that were almost right, but none of them were 100% accurate. And so precautions weren't being taken properly. And so you had a disease that was even more contagious than COVID. And much, 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 much more deadly. Um, death rates of people who contract it and show symptoms are enormously, shockingly, horrifyingly high. Um, so if you look at this map, uh, it shows you kind of a timeline of where and when it breaks out in Europe. The darkest kind of orange russet color is where you see some outbreaks in 1347. So you can see some of Turkey there a little bit um on the European side, Constantinople, um, which is now Istanbul. And then you see Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, a tiny bit of southern France. And then the next wave is from 1348. That's when most people are going to be introduced to this in Europe for the most part. It travels very fast. It goes from person to person and it wipes out entire populations, locally speaking. Uh, the plague is so deadly um, that... I, I mean, I, I can't tell you specific numbers because the records just aren't complete enough, but I can tell you uh, records that are fairly accurate about death rates in places that are hit early, hit very hard, severely or repeatedly. You can see as much as two thirds of people uh, die as a result of the plague. If you're talking about very small communities, you can have everybody die. Um, Overall, in Europe, and this is going to include the regions that you see on the map as green, where there are only very few scattered minor outbreaks or no outbreaks at all. Overall, in Europe, we're going to see about one in three people will perish as a result of the plague. Not necessarily in this first wave, but overall. So this is a disease devastating on a level that we have not ever seen in the modern world, um, at, on this scale at least, um, and that hadn't been seen in Europe um, since uh, there was a major, I guess, 6th century outbreak as well, uh, but it wasn't as bad as this very likely. So it, it was something that came seemingly out of the blue. Everybody started getting sick. It spread enormously rapidly. People who got sick died in a very, very high percentage of cases. And in many times, uh, in many cases, the disease progressed very quickly. It was also very unpleasant and a terrible way to die. Bubonic plague, uh, it's called that because uh, when you are infected, your lymph nodes swell up and blacken and kind of turn yucky. And um, these are, so you have these kind of like lumpy, gross, discolored um, kind of buboes, as they were called, all over your body. And then your lungs kind of fill with fluid and then you die. It's really unpleasant. We're not going to dwell on it. But it was horrifying. And once it turns into the pneumonic form, where it infects people's lungs, they can pass it not just through the bites of fleas, which is primarily how it's transmitted in the bubonic form, but it can be passed directly from person to person and becomes massively, massively infectious and it travels very quickly and it kills people very quickly as well. So a person can be fine in the morning. There are many accounts of this uh, from the 1300s, walking around, feeling pretty good, and then by evening time, dead. This was the sort of rapidity with which the disease struck. It was primarily transmitted and communicated by fleas, as I mentioned, specifically the fleas of rodents. Um, it's uh, rats, first and foremost, in Europe. People didn't know that. It's uh, important to emphasize this. They didn't know that it was the fleas of rats that were transmitting the disease, carrying the disease, and harboring the disease so that it could get into the population. Uh, once it became pneumonic and it was spreading from person to person, um, people kind of had an idea but didn't really know how to effectively combat it. And so many people get sick and so many people die 
that it becomes a logistical nightmare. There was no way to get out of. So I have here uh, one uh, medieval account, or late medieval, I guess you could say, uh, 14th century account, uh, written by a guy named Agnolo de Tura. Uh, he's a resident of Siena. And this is the time period, again, we're pointing to something that is less common in the Middle Ages or almost uncommon. Agnolo de Tura is just a guy. He's not a clergyman. He's just a person who's leaving a personal account. Uh, so in many ways, you can see his account as evidence of moving toward a modern world in itself. But what it describes is horrific. It describes what it was like in Siena. Um, okay, so Agnola describes that the city is in this kind of a situation. Father abandoned child, wife, husband, one brother, another, for this illness seemed to strike through the breath and sight. Remember, nobody really knows how disease is being transmitted. People are theorizing that just looking at a person who has bubonic plague could make you infected. Um, and when they say it strikes through the breath, where breathing on a person or breathing the same air as a person, they're not exactly wrong. Um, and so they died. None could be found to bury the dead for money or friendship, because, of course, you'd be exposed to a person and their bacterial infection if they got too close to these bodies. And it was really one of the worst parts of the bubonic plague is that the deceased were highly contagious as well as the living. Uh, so nobody wanted to touch dead bodies. But if you don't bury people who have died of the plague, you're only creating a much worse situation because the bacteria is still just kind of lying around, ready to be transmitted through flea bites and various other contacts, etc. And plus, it's horrific. Okay, so members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could without priest, without divine offices. In many places in Siena, great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of dead, and they died by the hundreds day and night, and all were thrown in those ditches and covered with earth. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more were dug. I, Agnola de Tura, buried my five children with my own hands. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. So imagine for a moment this scenario. Um, I know that we currently are in the middle of a pandemic, but imagine that instead of the, the kind of infection and death rates that we're currently wrestling with, which are horrible in themselves, we're dealing with a situation where a third of your town, one in three people dies, two in three people in some places. If you live in a small village, it could be everybody. It absolutely untethers every aspect of life. It's going to destroy um, all of the, the sort of stable institutions that people had called on. The, the pure logistical horror of it, uh, people are struggling to bury the dead. In some areas, as I mentioned, as much as 60% of the population die. And so there's this great need to bury people who are dead because you can't just leave them around or they're just spreading the disease. At the same time, nobody wants to do it or nobody can do it. And it's very enormously uh, sort of traumatic for everybody who lives through this. As a result, People who do survive the outbreak of the plague very often are going to form what's known as burial societies. These are people who are not clergy, but they will join clubs, basically, that promise, this is really what their function is, that if anything happens to one of the club members, they promise and agree that they will all make sure that that person gets buried <laughs> once they die. Um, so it's an interesting sign of the times, but this becomes an enormously popular move. The church ends up suffering as much or more as any institution uh, in the 1300s as a result of the outbreak of the plague. And the reason for that is varied, uh, but really it revolves around the idea that um, the church, the clergy really is the last line of defense of people who are ill. Uh, to the extent that anybody is providing uh, care for people who are sick, something that would be the equivalent of a hospital, for instance, those institutions are provided for, staffed by members of the clergy. Those are the only ones that exist, and they're fairly rare. But even if we're talking about people 
as individuals who are very sick, medical care is not what you might call really reliable in the later Middle Ages. Um, it's not something you would call upon uh, doctors very frequently. They did exist, uh, but it wasn't something the average person generally even thought about unless the situation were terribly um terribly dire, I guess, or really chronic. Uh, generally speaking, if somebody were sick and it looked like they might die, people called a priest and they wanted the priest to uh, administer extreme unction. So to give them kind of the last rites in case they die so that their soul is prepared. Um, and also this was the idea that you'd offer somebody comfort, pray for divine intervention, because you knew that medicine was not in a state that could actually help them if they're sick in this way. And so logically enough, the first people who are going to die as a result of the Black Death are going to be clergy, priests who are called out to minister to the sick, people who are monks who are administering to those places where the sick people are brought, where people in their desperation are held, people who are priests who are called out to bury the dead are exposed and they get sick and they die and the clergy spread it amongst themselves they live together and so the clergy is going to die at a much higher rate than the general population they're going to be among the first to die in any community and they are going to be badly terribly affected and the outcome of this is this grim choice where the clergy either have to um abnegate, which is a fancy word for saying that they, they turn their back. They either have to turn their back on their duties, on the things they swore a divine oath to provide, care for the sick, uh, burial of the dead. They have to either turn their back, close the doors of the church and refuse to minister to people, or they end up dying and spreading the disease. And so they're in this horrible position. A huge number of the clergy are going to die. Uh, others are going to be uh, sort of left at loose ends where they sort of run away from their responsibilities. They're not necessarily people who are going to be uh, courageous or highly respected after the fact. This has a massive psychological impact on people with the church. Now, this is a, a situation that Agnolo de Toro just explained to you, the guy from Siena, seemed like the end of the world. You have places where two out of every three people are dying and it just everything falls apart. Government can't function like that. You can't collect taxes when there's an outbreak of plague. You can't uh, just go about your business and do your work. Nothing can happen in the way that it's supposed to happen. And in this horrible situation, people turn to the church and look for advice and help. And what do they find is everybody's dead or fled and left and left them alone. And so this is going to have this massive psychological effect on people who survive uh, this experience of the Black Death. Some people, as you can see the image here, some of them came from the ranks of clergy to begin with, some of them did not, are simply going to take this as evidence that God is angry, that the church has been going in the wrong direction, that all of their uh, kind of flirtations in Italy with dealing with the merchant families and accepting big gifts of fabulous new churches and decorations and all the kind of wonderful stuff that happens as a result of the uh, kind of expansion of the economy, that this was the wrong step, that we're going the wrong way, that we should rededicate ourselves to pure religiosity. And so the most extreme example of this are the people known as the flagellants. You can see a woodcut of them there, where um, they are people who are attempting to appease the wrath of God. They assume this whole plague thing must be the wrath of God. So in order to try to keep that from getting worse, they will perform very public penance to make up for the sinfulness of themselves and of society. So in this case, you have people who are literally hitting themselves with whips. This is an extreme form of something known as asceticism. Um, where you deny the appetites of the body. Now, usually the way asceticism works is that if you are a monk, you decide that you want to pursue this, you will perform acts of strong fasting where you don't eat for long periods of time, you stay awake for long periods of time, you stand up rather than sit down or lie down and rest for long periods of time. You basically put your body through a series of denials where you don't let your physical appetites dictate your behavior. You're hungry, but you don't eat. You're tired, but you don't rest. You want sex, but you don't have it. Those are all kind of uh, for versions of asceticism. In this case, it goes to an even more extreme level where 
people's basic appetite to not feel pain is being denied and people are hitting themselves with whips, all of it, whether you're fasting or you're hitting yourself with a whip, is all centered around this idea that by doing this, you are demonstrating to yourself and to God and to anybody who might be watching that your spirit, your desire to be pure, your desire to do God's will is stronger than your body. It's stronger than your physical drives and needs. And so you have some people who are like, we've got to really double down. We've got to do God's will. We've got to like clean up all of our act. We've got to um, make sure that we are purifying ourselves. On the other side, you have people go completely the opposite direction. Left alone, they're like, what did the church ever do for us? We've been following these rules, been doing what they said they should do. And look, look, look what's happened to our society. We're all going to die. And I'm not going to give up my last chance to have a party. Um, that's where you get this image is the dance macabre, the dance of death, uh, where people assume they're dead people walking. And with society in shreds and tatters, they're like, you know what? We're just going to break into the rich dead guy's house where he's fled or he's dead uh, and get into the wine cellar and drink it and dance around till we happen to die because we're all dying anyway. What do we have to lose? And then once the, the plague passes over and people st it slows down and people stop dying, uh, people who are survivors start looking around themselves and they're like, you know what? I'm not sure that we can trust the clergy. First of all, the people we have left are those who were uh, chickens and ran off and didn't do what they were supposed to be doing in the first place. Uh, and second of all, trusting the clergy didn't do us any good before. Maybe we should be more critical. And so criticism of the church, particularly criticism of the clergy, becomes possible in the world after the Black Death in a way that it wasn't before in Europe. Um, that's what it means by anti-clericalism. The panic of the, the outbreak is going to give way to people being more skeptical and also taking more of an active role in providing for themselves some of the services that the church traditionally did. That's what lay orders are. So people who haven't taken any kind of oaths, they don't have any special education usually, they haven't got any training, but they realize that if the church breaks down, there's nobody to bury the dead. So they agree that they will um, provide that service. They realize that there's nobody to administer communion. There's nobody to, uh, I guess, um, help out baptizing people who need it and they they form uh, orders they form clubs basically of people who are not clergy but they're going to start filling the job of clergy helping out with charity and social welfare they're just kind of start filling those places and so the hegemony the kind of exclusive right of the church to provide these services begins cracking open following the black death and that's going to be an avenue to change in society um, also, as I mentioned, the sort of skepticism that's brought about by the surviving, the experience of surviving the Black Death and not accepting the church's word for it on everything is also going to encourage this kind of backlash in a positive way. You have both simultaneously. You have some parts of society that are uh, dealing with backlash in a way that makes them much more conservative. They want to be much more religiously strict. They want to be much more, um, I guess, negative uh, toward uh, luxuries and any kind of indulgence of the physical selves. On the flip side, you have people where the backlash has the opposite change that says, okay, maybe we should embrace life and how good it is to be alive. Maybe we should embrace how good it is to be human instead of thinking of ourselves as horrible and our bodies as bad and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we should go the other way. And broadly speaking, this movement is referred to as humanism, a kind of enjoying and embracing the kind of good qualities about being human instead of just bemoaning the fact that we're not more like God. The impact of the Black Death really cannot be overstated. Absolutely every, every 
uh, aspect of society is going to be thrown into chaos. There is literal panic in the streets in places where it's breaking out heavily. There are rebellions. Uh, when it comes down to the feudal system, the economic system, that can't continue as it was meant to either. Because if your whole system relies on peasants being tied to the land, farming and not leaving, and a disease comes sweeping through, and one in three of them dies. If your landowners die, the, the Black Death does not respect uh, status in any way. With the exception of royalty, I don't believe there are any sitting monarchs that die of the Black Death. They are able to ensure enough isolation for themselves that they escape it. But everybody else, levels of nobility, um, important wealthy merchants, everybody down to the poorest of the poor, are going to be afflicted and end up dying of it. Um, when you have this kind of level of death, you have farms where practically everybody is wiped out. Next door, the farm might not be touched at all. Um, you have businesses that are entirely wiped out. You have people who are thrown into an uproar and chaos. And so naturally enough, they begin moving around. Um, if most of your workforce dies, you can no longer continue farming the land you live on. Those peasant rules and laws that kept you tied to that place break down. It ends up destroying and killing the feudal system, uh, as you might refer to it as the feudal system and in terms of an economic system in Europe. It breaks down all of the sort of traditional ways of doing things, all of the institutions that are meant to uh, govern how um, politics work in societies break down and have to be reinvented after the Black Death. Everything has to change. Business cannot go on as usual. And so what ends up happening is this becomes a moment in history, uh, a long moment, but it becomes an opportunity to transform at a pace that was unthinkable. Um, the, the seeds of that change, we've already talked about that, were in place, but they really didn't happen. The change didn't actually take place at a very fast pace at all. It was happening, but it was happening slowly. After the Black Death, everything, military structure, economic structure, political structure, religious structure, everything is going to be transformed. So in the Black Death, the culprit spreading the disease across Europe. Now, the uh, disease itself is bacterial. Um, it's mostly carried in the stomachs and digestive system of fleas. And the fleas are going to be transmitted primarily by this fella in Western Europe. The fleas do live on other types of rodents elsewhere in the world, but the black rat is going to be the one who's going to be moving it through European ports and into European cities. And the disease is going to spread so terribly, at least in part because it, it retains this reservoir in this species that is ubiquitous. It's everywhere through Europe. And it's on ships and you can't stop them and they kind of get into port cities. It's impossible to kind of stop the spread. It's not totally impossible. If you think back to the map I showed, there are a few areas of green. If you live in a rural place, if you're in Central Europe, uh, in what is now Germany and Poland, etc., far away from river systems, far away from the shore, there wasn't a huge outbreak of the Black Death. If you live in the Pyrenees, high up in the mountains, there wasn't a big outbreak of the Black Death, in part because the conditions are just not favorable to that bacteria thriving and into the fleas and rats getting into that area as well as the people carrying it, are in low population density. And another uh, green area is around the city of Milan. Milan should have been a hot spot for the outbreak, but they weren't because when they heard rumors, there were enough inland and enough upland, they were up in the mountains enough, in the highlands, Piedmont, uh, that when they heard of the Black Death outbreaking in towns kind of close by, they slammed their city gates shut and anybody who tried to approach the walls, they shot to death. And so Milan managed to avoid a massive outbreak of the Black Death in this way. They simply uh, isolated and refused to let anybody in. 
Everywhere else in Europe, though, it is going to get in. It's going to spread. Panicked people who are fleeing town where there's an outbreak spread it to other towns. It becomes unstoppable and it just kind of breaks out in massive waves. Uh, so the huge first one is in 1348. Then it'll kind of die down. Um, it'll sort of hits the edge of Europe and then it'll break out again. It's a bacterial disease. You cannot be fully immune to it. Uh, even if they'd had vaccines, a vaccine wouldn't have helped you against the Black Death. Once it becomes pneumonic, it's incredibly contagious and you can't really be safe really ever. And it just kind of comes on in waves and it will happen for about 100, 150 years in Europe. It will be died down. The massive outbreak was in 1348, 1349, 1350 um, throughout Europe. That's where you have the huge death of everyone. But then you'll have other kind of secondary outbreaks that keep happening for about a hundred years until it finally sort of stops. And there's various debates over why it eventually stops. And one of the theories Okay, so the bubonic plague is carried uh, in the digestive system of the flea. Fleas that specifically live on black rats and assorted other rodents. I don't know if you knew this, but fleas are species specific, which is to say that they have preferred animals that they will live on as hosts and don't really live on others. So in other words, if there's a flea that lives on a dog, they might bite a human, but they don't like it and they will find another dog to be their host as quickly as possible. They won't just live on a human. And this is relevant because at some point around the time when uh, the, the Black Death stops breaking out in Europe, this guy, the Rattus norvegicus brown Norway rat, begins expanding its territory. We're not entirely sure why. It may have to do with shipping and trade and expansion, and so the brown rat is introduced into places where it might not have been earlier. It might have to do with climate change. We're not entirely certain, but this fella is your standard New York City subway rat. This is the rat people think of when they think about rats today, because right around that time period, in the mid 1400s, this guy took over the territory of the black rat and the fleas of the brown rat do not carry the plague. And the brown rat is, as I mentioned, bigger, meaner, more omnivorous and highly territorial. And where it spread in Europe, it drove black rats out in a way that humans and cats and every other factor that you might have tried to use to get rid of rats did not succeed. This guy did. And so... If you wanted to point to anybody and say, who do we have to thank for the Black Death stopping its periodic uh, destruction of life and society and people in uh, Europe in the Middle Ages or in New York City now, you can point to this fella and say, thank you, brown rat, for saving us from the plague. Now, today, of course, we, we do have antibiotics and the plague would react to that. But here we have him. There he is. So this is where we're going to stop today. Um, next time we're going to pick up with the Hundred Years War and the Renaissance. It's going to be great. So thanks for watching.